why does entrenchment increase over time naturally? And when can entrenchment be disrupted peacefully? Which is oftentimes what economists call creative destruction. And I'm reading this book right now. I'm actually not that far into it, but I had some thoughts and wanted to lay out a video just laying out the basics of entrenchment. Now, I think it's helpful to think of entrenchment both in the business setting and also in the government setting because entrenchment is going to increase in both places over time. The question worth starting with if we want to understand this is going to be, when is entrenchment a good thing? And of course, if we think of entrenchment on this spectrum, where one end of the spectrum has flexibility of a system, responsiveness of a system to the people involved in it, the people that that system serves, and then on the other side of the spectrum, we have rigidity and sort of lots of paperwork, um, difficulties and barriers in place for changing the system or for getting things done or for responding to changing environments. Obviously, entrenchment is on one side of this spectrum. But we might acknowledge that there are places where we actually want entrenchment. Um, and, and the reason for that is we want systems that have some stability. We want systems that are not super easy to manipulate from people who come along who are very power hungry, who have their own agenda, who want to sort of bend the system in their favor. And entrenchment can actually protect against that kind of overtake. Now, the business example I would like to point to has to do with a social media startup that has certain protections for your privacy and for the way your data will be used. You would actually want some of those privacy protections to be entrenched in the system. And at the same time, if it's a startup, that system has to figure out ways of being flexible, ways of adapting to its competitive environment, ways of figuring out what people want and delivering that. And sort of the problem that startups have to solve is how do you make your system flexible enough so that it finds its niche in the market? So in general, with most systems, there are going to be parts of the system that you want to be entrenched and difficult to change and parts of the system that are much more flexible. The government example here might be, if we go back to the beginning of the country, of the United States, they actually didn't have term limits for the president of the United States. So George Washington chose to step down, and later they implemented term limits. And we might think about it and realize, actually, a lot of systems have been sort of overtaken by dictators who get rid of the term limit piece of that constitution. So to protect from dictators taking over, we might want term limits to be absolutely entrenched. That would be a good thing. Our next question is, why do systems increase in entrenchment over time? And there are some good reasons for this and some bad reasons for this. So the good reasons have to do with the fact that when a company or a new government is first getting its feet off the ground, the people running that don't know exactly what the perfect system is going to look like. Because in both cases, the system sort of is embedded in a social network and has to interact in that social network and put structure on that social network in a way that works well with the people it's serving. And pretty much the only way of doing that is putting a system out there and figuring out where the system's working and not working and updating the system to make it work better in that social setting or that competitive setting and um, being really flexible to begin with. But then once you figure out things that both work and that are important to maintain, that's the point at which you entrench those parts of the system. Systems learn over time. And part of the entrenchment process is learning what works and what doesn't work and entrenching the things that work while leaving the things you haven't quite yet figured out a little bit more flexible. And part of the deal here is that it takes a lot of energy to experiment in a system. You have to have people who are 
comparing, people who are thinking carefully about any experimentation you're doing, and you don't have infinite resources in a system, so you want to channel those resources towards the things that could benefit most from improving. You want to channel the attention of all of the workers in that system, all of the people who are in charge of making it work. You want to channel those optimally. So once you've figured out that something is working really well, the best thing may be to entrench that so that nobody has to pay attention to it, nobody has to maintain it or do all the upkeep, it's just fully entrenched. And therefore your people can go and pay attention to other problems that matter to improve the system incrementally. So that's the good reason for entrenchment to increase over time. What about the bad reason? Well, the bad reason is basically about gaming the system. You're always going to have people that recognize the power of a system and come in and try to use the system to serve their own purposes. So over time, and as the system sort of gets more transparent, as the system is out there for more people to figure out all of the different mechanisms at play, you're going to have more and more people figure out how to work the system, how to game it. And as long as those people are sort of giving advantages and bringing people into the system that are their collaborators, their co-conspirators, then that group of people is probably going to entrench the system to their benefit over time. So this gets at the answer to our next question, which is when does entrenchment become a problem? And there's basically two reasons entrenchment could become a problem. The first and the most obvious is this sort of people using the system to serve their interests rather than the interests of the, the entire community. And then the second potential problem is that the system is entrenched in a way that works well in the past, maybe when there's horse and buggy, or maybe when there's phones, or maybe when just the world looked different. Maybe the system has entrenched the parts of the system that work well in that past environment. But the system does not work that well in the new, constantly changing, technologically innovative world. So the second one is actually a way a system can be entrenched, even without bad actors. And if we're thinking about how this works, a lot of times entrenchment happens through rules and red tape and many different layers of people whose approval you need to get something done. And this happens both in companies and also in governments where I'm sure you've interacted with a company where you need some kind of customer service and you're constantly going in circles on the phone trying to get the right person, constantly hearing it can't be done, there's rules against that, that's against the, the legal jargon that's at the bottom of this contract. You've been part of systems that do that. Now in the business setting, a lot of times there's a trade-off between the size of the business and this kind of a red tape. Because there are obviously competitive advantages to being large, there's monopoly power, there is economies of scale, but the larger a system is, the more parts of it need to be entrenched for it to actually function. And of course, the same thing is true of government bureaucracy, where there's all kinds of sludge. The book Sludge is actually a great book about just sort of government inefficiencies and barriers that are in place to try to uh, to try to protect the rules, but which can really get in the way of making a system functional. Now our last question is, how do entrenched systems get disrupted? And when can that happen peacefully? And when does it require some kind of rebellion or some kind of major um, conflict? Now, on the business side of things, we have mechanisms for creative destruction. And creative destruction is where you recognize that a system is pouring energy into something that is kind of wasteful. And so creative destruction is basically getting rid of that waste. And creative destruction can happen within companies. For example, leaders might shut down a unit of the company if they do an analysis and recognize, oh yeah, people in that part of the company are not really contributing in a meaningful way. 
So good leaders can recognize where there needs to be creative destruction. Now, almost all destruction is going to be painful to someone. Like there's going to be someone who loses their job or at the very least loses what they've developed skills in over time, even if you move that person to a different part of the company. Now, competitive markets can also generate creative destruction simply by having new businesses come in and outcompete businesses that are really entrenched. That's also not a painless process. People do lose their jobs, leaders of the companies lose their positions, but it's a natural part of the economic environment that people have kind of accepted. In the political environment, obviously we have elections that act similarly in terms of creative destruction, where if you have leaders who are feeding an entrenched system without uh, investing in the needed updates, those leaders can be voted out of office. And hopefully the idea would be that the new leaders would come in and uh, and do and take the steps necessary to get rid of the entrenched parts of the system. But of course, if you have a lot of money being exchanged behind the scenes, people being set up by perhaps corporations or big money to serve their interests, you could get a situation where even though elections sort of overturn the people in charge, the people who end up winning the elections are all so deeply connected with the system and the money and the the sources of entrenchment that nothing actually gets creatively destroyed. And in some ways, that's where rebellion comes into place. Of course, rebellion is going to be dangerous because um, if you rebel and, and try to overturn parts of the system, what is going to rise up in its place? And that thing that rises up could, um, could be bad, could be good. It's something we've never seen before.